welcome to the Stadium Journey podcast. We hope everyone out there is taking care of yourself as this quarantine stretches on and on and on. As things start to reopen, though, please be safe and please be respectful to each other. If you're looking for something to do while you're practicing your proper social distancing, go to our website, stadiumjourney.com, or follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram at Stadium Journey. And the Stadium Journey podcast is proud to be part of the VOC Nation radio network. To find all of our old episodes, type VOC Nation into your smartphone podcast app, or you can go to the Stadium Journey website. All of our old podcasts are there. And we also stream live on twitch.tv slash DanLaw83. And we stream live on Facebook Live and Twitter Live. And let me take a minute and introduce our starting lineup tonight. We've got Dave Cotney. You can follow him at ProFan9. Mark Viquez can be followed at Ballpark Hunter. You can follow our producer, the above average comedian, Dan Calachico, at DanLaw83. And I am Paul Baker. You can follow me at PuckmanRI. And we are very happy tonight to be joined by Chris Creamer, the founder and editor of one of my favorite websites, sportslogos.net. Welcome, Chris, and thanks for joining us tonight. Hey, thank you very much for having me here, guys. How's everyone thanks. doing? Doing I'm, well? feeling, I'm feeling very essential. <laughs> feeling very Olympic. <laughs> Thank you. Somebody got the reference. Uh, Chris, before we get going, do you want to take a second and uh, let our listeners know where they can find you on social media and uh, tell us a little bit about your website? Sure. Well, I'm on Twitter at SportsLogosNet, uh, Facebook, Instagram, same name. Uh, SportsLogos.net's website I started about 23 years ago now. Jeez. Uh, and it just sort of covers the history as well as the news and rumors, discussion, all about sports logos, uniforms, all throughout history, all around the world. I think we've got something like 37,000 logos on there now. Uh, and yeah, 23 years worth of work. And uh, check it out if you haven't. Yeah, if you're looking for uh, any kind of information about logos for really any of the big four sports and beyond, right, you can find it all there. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we, we do cover leagues all around the world, but obviously the focus is on the big four North American sports. Um, you know, I, I, you know, being a Canadian, I, I try to focus on the NHL. That's sort of my pride to, to make sure that's as up to date as possible. But, you know, we, we do a big focus on Major League Baseball, NFL, NBA. And because so many of you Americans love it, I do college sports, even though I don't know a thing about it. <laughs> oh, wow. How about that? <laughs> yeah. But is that a scoop? <laughs> Not Things you didn't know about Chris Creamer. Site. Yeah, that's right. So, in case you're wondering why the NCAA section might not be up to snuff, that's <laughs> did not know that. Okay, yeah, it might be slightly harder to maintain with the 360 oh, some odd schools as opposed to what 30 NHL teams. Yeah. <laughs> Oregon alone, Oregon alone with their uniform right. changes. Holy yeah. cow! Yeah. <laughs> Just trying to figure out the conferences alone is, is a headache. So I don't know how you guys do it. Kudos no. to you. Yeah. All right. So uh, you said uh, you're, you're a Canadian, a good Canadian, uh, be, being a good Canadian. You're a hockey fan. So let's jump right into the news that got featured. I think I actually learned this from you, that uh, the Colorado Avalanche are considering bringing back the Quebec Nordique sweaters for next year. What's your take on that? Um, well, I learned about it from The Athletic. I don't want to take credit for it. Uh, my take on it is I love any sort of nod to history. And I know a lot of people are split on this. Uh, Quebec moved to Colorado. A lot of people feel if you change your name, you relocate, that's it. You, you lose your ties to that history. But where else are we going to see the Quebec Nordiques uniform and logo these days in the NHL? Like, well, the Canadians aren't going to wear it. Uh, Quebec's not getting a team anytime soon. So I would rather see it being worn by the team that was actually the, the Quebec Nordiques than to be not worn at all. So that's my feeling. It's, it's a great uniform. It's a great sweater. Uh, and wear it. Why not? It, it's the 25th anniversary of the move. So why not honor it? Would you feel the same if they were using the, uh, the never seen uh, Husky logo? <laughs> I would love that. <laughs> Are you kidding? That would be content for a week. <laughs> but, but still, like, just as, as a uniform and logo fan, like, that Nordique's unused sweater with the, uh, the Husky on it, that's like, that's almost like a white whale, right? Like mm. something you really want to see. Uh, and maybe that's one way of sort of compromising or softening the blow with Quebec fans in that 
you know, yeah, this wasn't already Xenoform, but you guys really have no ties to this. You have no emotional bond to it. Uh, and it's sort of a fun way to get everyone, you know, paying respects to the franchise by wearing this sort of never was. Uh, mm. you know. So have you heard from any Nordiques fans who are who are thinking this is an atrocity and really upset by it? Or There are quite a few people on Twitter that are upset. I don't think any of them are genuine Nordiques fans <laughs> <laughs> from 25 years ago. Um, but I saw the same thing when the Hurricanes wore the Hartford Whalers uniforms a year and a half ago. Uh, it was no one was sort of on the fence about it. It was either this is the greatest thing ever or, you know, burn down the entire league. I'm never watching a game again. Mm. Um, just, you know, it runs deep with some people. They, they feel that, you know, this is a stolen team and you shouldn't go back and, and wear the old uniform. It, they, they feel it's sort of rubbing their noses in it more than paying their respects to it. And I, I love what Carolina did because they, they tried to do it to try to include Whalers fans as much as possible. They, they wore them against the Whalers old division rivals against Boston and they took them on the road to wear them in Boston too, where, you know, the closest to Hartford. And then they took a lot of the proceeds, uh, like there's doing some sort of charitable collection. I can't remember the exact details and they donated, donated it to a uh, local Hartford uh, charity. So it was a way to sort of include the community, say, you know, sure, we left, and yeah, we're wearing your old uniform, but at least we're still taking care of you some way. And they also followed the old Whalers tradition by losing to Boston both times they wore them. <laughs> that's, that's, well, you yeah. had to get that in, did you? <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's, it would be a totally different story if there was something else in Hartford, right? Or if there was another team. So let's say that a team comes back to Quebec City at some point, you know, that. I think that's when the window closes and that's when probably the avalanche have to just give it up. Right. Like it's a totally, it's a totally different thing. Like, I, I don't know. I couldn't see, I couldn't see the New Jersey devils wearing the old Colorado Rockies. Um, I would love to see it though. Uniform. But... I, I, I wouldn't mind seeing it, but I'd rather see the avalanche wear it. Right. Whereas, whereas it, it makes no sense to me for the for the devils to wear the rockies because there is still a team in there is well a new team in colorado now i mean i, I could see the devils wearing it if uh they wanted to play a game let's say there was an exhibition game in denver you know maybe you do that but i, I could see the devils wearing a kansas city scouts jersey and i'm sure a lot of devil fans including myself would love to see that but that's an organization that has been very traditional they, they just wear the two sweaters, and it was only recently that they brought back their old jerseys as alternatives. So uh, we're not even going to see a third jersey from that team that's kind of new and original, let alone a throwback. But I, I'd love to see an Oakland Seals jersey. I would love to see, um, you know, some of these older teams, an old uh, – trying to think of some of the teams that, that played in the league at one time uh, – Hamilton Tigers or New York Americans jersey, you know, think, think Montreal Maroons. I would love to see those jerseys brought back uh, just for, you know, any kind of a hockey game, whether it's exhibition or, you know, a special promotional game. Now imagine if the NHL had a big centennial celebration recently. Wouldn't that have been a great thing to do? <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. I totally miss that. 100th anniversary of the league. You could have had league-wide throwback days, but – they didn't really do anything. The Maple Leafs wore arenas throwbacks that one day, and that was it, right? Yeah, yeah. I thought the 75th anniversary was a bigger deal than the 100th anniversary. In fact, I felt mm -hmm. Good point. even the way they wore their patches were, was very awkward yeah. compared to what I'm used to. Right. A lot uh, of the 100th anniversary in terms of the sort of on-ice uniform part of it didn't really make a lot of sense to me. Uh, like you said, the patch placement was just sort of off, off to the side. You know, throw it right up here where everyone can see. Yeah, um, an afterthought. And, and I brought it up just a, a few minutes ago, but, like, imagine a league-wide throwback thing. You know, uh, 100 years, you have 10 decades. Everyone wears their 1910 uniform you know, where applicable. Everyone wears 1920s uniforms one week, 1930s. You, you know, you go through the entire uh, mm. season and stuff like that. Just have a lot of fun. Yeah. And for the NHL's point of view, you sell all those uniforms. Yeah, we're going to sell it. And, yeah, it would have been so much more memorable than what they ended up doing. But don't you have to be careful in, in, in some cases, that, and I'm, not, I'm definitely not the expert that you are, but I would say, you know, the NFL has tried this, and not on a grand scale, but they've brought back some of those old uniforms, 
and um, like the Pittsburgh Steelers is one that comes to mind and it, their old time uniform is, is atrocious. Like there is, there is the nothing, bumblebee. There's nothing nice about that. Uh, the Packers is, is pretty bad too. Um, so, you know, it, I mean, it's great to say, Hey, yeah, let's bring it back. But you know, other than the Ottawa 67s, you know, that to me, that barbershop pole kind of look, it, it doesn't come off <laughs> very well. Well, that's part of the fun of this, right? Like, yeah, when like we it. throw back, if it's a one-time thing, right? We're not going to have uh, the Pittsburgh Steelers wear those terrible uniforms on a permanent basis, or the Eagles wearing those blue and uh, blue and yellow, yellow that they wear. Um, as a one-time thing, it's it's a lot of fun. You tune into the game, you watch it, you see photos of these guys, and uh, for for me, what I love is when a team throws back to a uniform that they were wearing when I started watching the game, right? Like to me it doesn't feel like a throwback. It just feels like that's what they're supposed to look like. And um, yeah, so uh, sometimes it's even uglier the better, right? So you yeah. want Cooperalls to come back. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Always comes back to Cooperalls, Dave. It's, it's, Always it's, comes it's, back to Cooperalls. <laughs> Not enough teams wore them in the NHL. <laughs> you could do the whole OHL, just Cooperall week. Everybody's yeah, wearing yeah. the Cooperalls. And, and the Providence Friars. Oh, yeah, that was a good find. <laughs> so, uh, Chris, uh, speaking of jerseys people wore when you were a kid, uh, what about baby blue away jerseys in baseball that are making a comeback with certain teams? What's your thought on that? I'm sort of on the fence with that. Um, hmm. Again, I, I like the look for some teams. Uh, for other teams, not so much. Um, it, this is a tough one because I, I love the traditional road gray. So when the Jays okay. did the road grays in 89, I thought, oh, finally we look like a baseball team, right? We oh, look like, sort of like the new kid on the block. And then they went ahead and they won the World Series wearing those road grays. So now, you know, now we're married. <laughs> in love we had a that. kid together. Yeah, I'm in love with that uniform forever. It doesn't matter what, they, what else they do, what else they bring out. The road grays of that sort of original style, I love. Um, to me, you know, I, I guess it depends on the team. Uh, the Expos can get away with the powder blue. The Royals can get away with the powder blue. Um, and maybe oddly enough, the St. Louis Cardinals can get away with the powder blue. I see one. 82. Two, two heads shaking on that. Yeah. No, I wasn't a fan. And, and that was when I grew up. The powder blue I just era. Hate, the I just hate the Cardinals. <laughs> well, I mean, I saw Minnesota has a nice powder blue. Not exact throwback, but very similar. I think it looks gorgeous. And, and it's... It, it, Powder blue's making a comeback, right? How many it's, teams came out with a new powder blue uniform this year? Like four it's been a lot. Yeah. What, what, what about the Phillies powder blue? Phil, yeah, no, that that's a good look. That's a watch that's out, Dan's going to run to his closet. That's a look I remember as a kid when the Mets would play the Phillies. They bust. That was a classic look. Oh, here comes the Phillies with their powder blue zipper, the big P on on, on the chest. Burgundies, yeah. Yeah, it, it was a great look. And you know what I don't like about the blues? I'm okay with the shirts. It's the pants. It's the pants. I, it, for some reason, and since, um, and I, I guess probably in, in, my, in my childhood, it was the Cubs that kind of started this. And I know it happened before. Uh, I know the White Sox did it before. But really, I remember the Cubs with different colors for shirt and pants before really Oh yeah, the pretty roots. much anyone else did. And once that happened, you know, the blue pants just, I, I don't know, didn't work for me. Um, so even like you said, Chris, with the Royals, uh, they could pull it off. Yeah, I, their, their blue jersey, great. With the gray pants, better. Yeah, I, I don't know. It's the, the, the powder blue pants I just can't take, I think. Well, we, we had sort of a soft reintroduction to the powder blues a few years ago, right? Like, like the, I think the Royals might have been the first ones to bring it back. Them or the Rays. I believe so. I think and, so. And both teams wore them with the white pants. Um, and now, like this year, all those teams that introduced powder blue is like Texas, Minnesota, uh, Toronto, might be forgetting one. But St. Louis. All, St. St. Louis last year. Yeah, last year. Philadelphia within the last couple of years. Wow. That's, a lot. Um, That's one they thought. And all of them with powder blue pants. So it seems like your, uh, your revolution of uh, two-colored powder blue shirt, white pants is, is a failure. It's not happening. We're, we're embracing the 80s uh, pajama look full on. Now, 
on the flip side, though, what did you think about what the Arizona Diamondbacks were doing with the really dark um, road uniform? I, I, I think most people don't like it. I actually did like it because it was very different and not, to me, it wasn't gaudy like, uh, like the Cuban national team in their bright red pants or anything like that. <laughs> but, you know, I'll give the Diamondbacks credit for trying something different. Uh, you know, there's only so long you can go with the traditional road, ga- road grays all across the board. Uh, I just feel like it didn't work in that case. It was just maybe too dark. Nearly, it was nearly black, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, again, this year uh, in November, the Padres, right? They they came out with their new road uniforms, and they're not gray. They are sort of a like a sand. Yeah, like a sand. Dark like sand. Brownish. Yeah. And they were very, very clear to tell me, this is not gray. Don't call it sand gray. Like, that's how I was going to describe it. They said, no, it's not gray at all. And then they even, like, pulled out the Pantones. Look, look, it's not gray. Look, look. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I feel like maybe going away from road grays is okay here and there. Powder blue might be a little bit too much. Um, what the Diamondbacks did was too much, just too dark. <laughs> but something like San Diego where – it's, it's sort of soft, it matches the color scheme, and it's not so overpowering that, you know, it just takes your attention away from everything else. Mm. Now, Chris, do you ever see a, a rebrand, and the moment you look at it, you think to yourself, oh, this is hideous, they're just going to change this in a couple years? Yeah, all the time. All nice the time. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, I'm that- find, um, I'm, what I'm finding hard now is, uh, sometimes I'll see a rebrand and I'll, I'll think to myself, oh, you know, that looks terrible and people are going to hate it because often I see these things in advance uh, mm-hmm. and then it comes out and everybody loves it. <laughs> and I'm just, well, it's a good thing I wasn't on some sort of consulting role with yeah. this brand. <laughs> you weren't part of the focus group there, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, like for one, one example was um, when the Seattle Mariners – they introduced their, uh, their alternate cream jersey, where it's like a blue and yellow recoloring of their mm-hmm. uh, current look. When I first saw that, I thought, oh, that looks horrible. Everyone's going to hate that. <laughs> and, and it they loved out, it. And everyone loved it. And now it's, you know, a lot of people, it's their personal favorite with the Mariners. And uh, it was at that point I thought, okay, maybe, maybe I'm losing touch. <laughs> maybe <laughs> You're getting old. Maybe I'm getting old. I don't know. Oh, boy, that's the worst feeling. Back when I was a kid, we wore Back when flannel I was a kid. and we liked it. <laughs> We had two yeah. uniforms, and that was it. All right, I was going to ask you before Mark jumped in. Uh, it's the same kind of question. Um, I think, what, like six or seven NFL teams have rebranded over this offseason? What, what's your take on them? In my opinion, most of them are, are not good. But what do you think of what you've seen? I, I think overall, uh, considering what we've seen Nike do to other NFL teams, that we should be counting our blessings. <laughs> <laughs> Tampa uh, Bay. Tampa Bay. I, I even like New England's changes. Um, <laughs> some more head shaking. Well, I'm thinking. No, they're nice. I just think it's too plain for me. And it's, it's not bad. Plain. It is plain, but again. I like plain. Think sometimes. of what. Sometimes. Think, it, it's all relative, right? Like, what has Nike done? We've seen what they've done. We <laughs> don't like what they've done. Like Mark said, Oregon. <laughs> <laughs> Tampa Bay oh. Bucks, whatever they had the last couple years. Yeah, ex- exactly. And now look at that. Like Tampa Bay yeah. basically just went back to what they wore before Nike took over. Mm-hmm. And now we love them. It's, oh, yeah. it's amazing. Oh, it's nice. All we had to do was take it away for us to fall in love with it again. There you go. I think the only miss from Nike this year is Atlanta. I'm not quite sure what they were thinking there. And talking about, you know, you, you see a rebrand, you can tell they're just going to change that in five years as soon as they see it. That's the Atlanta. Like that's, yeah. that's not going to last five years, especially the one with the gradient. That no. Is, that's going to be gone as soon as the NFL is not allowed to switch. <laughs> yeah. Well, how about the Rams? That's the one I think that's got in the most negative press. Well, so the Rams, I got to wait to see their uniforms first. Uh, the the logo, I kind of like what they were trying to do with it, but I feel like it didn't quite hit it. Uh, the idea of tying in the L.A. with the Ram horn and the fact that they're sharing a stadium with another team is kind of like saying, hey, you know, this is our market. We're L.A. You're not. But – Unfortunately, <laughs> it wasn't a very good design, and that sort of overshadows any sort of trash talk and they're trying to do with the Chargers there. I mean, do you think it was – do you think the Rams had it too easy? Just go back to what you wore before you left for St. Louis. Yeah, I don't stop, see what they, stop I don't, trying to reinvent the wheel. 
Right. Like, I don't see why they couldn't have just done that. It was clearly what everybody wanted uh, at the very least. And I mean, again, we haven't seen the uniforms yet, so mm -hmm. maybe the uniforms will look like something like that. But I feel like just a slight modernization of what they wore before, maybe just make the colors a little more modern, uh, clean up some of the lines. That's it. That's all you really had to do. I mean, how much money would some of these organizations save if they just listened to the fans? For example, San Diego. I mean, there was a Facebook uh, page dedicated to bring back Brown, but yet they spent thousands or millions of dollars on a focus group to see if that was the right decision. Well, a lot of cases, uh, and I'm not saying this is the case with San Diego, I'm speaking in generalities. Mm -hmm. um, an owner likes what an owner likes, regardless of what the fans want. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes it's just like, well, this is my team. I can make yeah. it the way I want to, right? And uh, if you don't like it, you don't have to buy the merchandise or you can buy the retro <laughs> merchandise that we have oh, in the store. Or in the case of the Padres, you wanted brown and gold. Okay, here's our flashback Friday uniform, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but after a while, we saw it with the Buffalo Sabres. We saw it with the Jets when they everyone was saying go back to white and then go back to green again, uh, where eventually the fans sort of get their way in the end if they just keep at it and keep pushing. Yeah. So... I, Listen to I, us. I want to take a, take this like way back, maybe where we should have started. So, <laughs> how, how did you how did you get into all this? How did this all how did this all start? How did you end up, you know, from if I read correctly, you you started this out as a kid, high school, and, and to where you are now. How, what what was that journey like? Uh, well, you know, I well before the internet was a thing. Uh, I was into sports logos and it was, I, I'm trying to, you know, in preparing for this discussion, uh, I was trying to think of when that sort of moment happened. And I think it was when uh, the trading card boom started in the, you know, 89, 90. And, and uh, a neighbor of ours uh, came over, found out we were collecting sports cards and brought over a big box of like 1981, 82 Opeachy hockey cards. And like, I have a pile of them right here, the same ones I got. And just going through them and like, and like coming across that, right? <laughs> ah, <laughs> there you go. I remember that year. There you go. I was, you know, when you're a hockey fan and you, know, you sort of take a liking to the uniforms, you're just like, what is this? <laughs> what is that? Right? Like there's no internet, right? So this is how I learned that the Rockies even existed. And it just sort of, opens up your mind. You're like, well, what else was there? What, what other teams existed? What other uniform logos did they wear? And uh, my dad would start like, he would, he would buy other cards just to show me the logo of uniforms, like um, the Milwaukee Brewers with the baseball glove, the M and the B. I'm looking at that and laughing at it going, why is their logo a baseball glove? That's, that's dumb, right? When you're a kid. And he goes, no, 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 no. <laughs> there you go. Look, he's got them too. Wow. But he goes, no, no, it's an M and a B. <laughs> oh, boy. And just looking at that going, wow, what other hidden meanings are in, in the other logos? And then finally, I only, I only figured that out like five years ago. I don't, I, I saw that when they did it. I don't understand how people couldn't see the M and the B there. I never got that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I figured that out myself, surprisingly. Expos, I had to read in their media guide from 1992 when I was at the gig yeah. that that was a hitting logo. So once once that was sort of introduced to me, I you know I fell in love with logos. I, I had to look at every team's logo, go back through all their history, and again, no internet, so the only way to see old uniforms and logos was either to find an old sports card, find an old magazine, or hope that there was a, a an old game on television. Uh, in the case of the Colorado Rockies, like. It took me 10 years to even realize that they had a home white uniform because there was no, yeah, hockey, card, there was no hockey card photos of them wearing white. And when I saw the clip of uh, uh, Billy Smith for the Islanders when he got that goal in like 80 or 81 or something, uh, and it was against the Rockies wearing their white uniform, I was like, whoa, okay, it did exist. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So, uh, Moving on, uh, my dad was big into computers, taught us how to use computers, and I learned how to program and code. And sometime around 96, he brought home a, a make your own internet kit sort of thing. Wow. And I, I just made a, a really sort of 
crummy website on tripod.com back in the day. I remember that. I and, remember that. Uh, it was just a collection of here are my favorite things, right? Links to the different, <laughs> like here's a link to Yahoo and here's a link to ESPN. And on that page, I, I put like a little collection of uh, CFL team logos. I, I felt, okay, I'm representing Canada on the internet, so I will do the CFL. And from there, I, I said, oh, let me just do an entire page on this stuff. And that's where the website started. It was just, uh, really, I, I really wanted to learn how to code. Uh, plus, I wanted a collection of logos for myself to be able to access easily. And it, it just grew, uh, grew from there. A, a, a combination of uh, luck and good timing, you know. Yeah, I'm with you there. When I, my love of logos and uniforms came from baseball cards. You know, I had a buddy who had uh, would come over with these old baseball cards from the 70s. And I remember seeing the Padres. I remember seeing uh, the, the White Sox when they had the red jerseys and the powdered blues. I'm like, man, that's what the White Sox wore? And you're right. That was the only place you can get these, uh, get these looks. So when I went to Cooperstown in 1989 with my mom and I saw their retro hats, we weren't even calling them retro hats. They just had a collection of old hats. I wanted every one of them. <laughs> I was like, ooh, mom, get me that one. Get me that one. So we settled on uh, Seattle Pilots and a California Angels with the lowercase a. I just thought that was the coolest logo uh, in the world. But, uh, but Chris, did you think that in the year 2020, almost 25 years later, you'd be making a living off of this website of yours? It, it uh, was, was that your goal? It, well, it wasn't, that wasn't a goal because that wasn't an option, right? Like, okay. That's uh, unrealistic. My goal was, well, let's get a good job as a web programmer somewhere and, mm -hmm. and just do that. And if I could somehow work for a professional sports team, that'd be amazing. Mm -hmm. um, when, when did this become a – when did you say, I can work on this? I don't have to have another job. This will be my sole job. How long ago was that? Well, it, it sort of helped that, uh, you know, I got married. My wife had a good job. And okay. I – I remember the phone call. This was summer of 2012, and I was kind of getting annoyed with the job I had. I worked as a, uh, a web developer for um, a company owned by the Toronto Star, and we did a website where you could see like uh, the grocery store coupons and and flyers and circulars and things like that. Uh, and I, you know, I'd been there a while. I, I was growing tired of it. And I called my wife and said, look, I want to do the Sports Logos website full time. I feel like I could do a really good job if I could focus on it. And with you still making a full time income, you know, we could do it. We could take the risk. And uh, she said no. <laughs> <laughs> she, she thought about it. She talked to her mother. And, uh, of course. And fortunately, fortunately her mother said, um, yeah, let him go for it. You know, like, how often do you get a chance like this? So we did it, and uh, I quit. And three days later, my wife told me she was pregnant with our first. So <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> now, we're, now we're down in income and uh, up one uh, dependent. And, but, you know, it's worked out for the best in the eight years since. This is, this is like preaching to the choir, right, guys? Like, I know. Oh, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> behind every good stadium journey, or there's, there's a... There's a supportive, uh, there's a supportive lady. <laughs> well, I mean, that's how this website uh, lasted as long. It's yeah, one of the original is. founders told his wife the same thing, you know, gonna, gonna focus on this full time. And, and uh, yeah, well, so. I fear that I didn't tell my wife anything. <laughs> I she asked, told you. I yes. asked my wife and I, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and she so, why aren't you at work? Okay. So how did, it, it sounds like you have a, a pretty good relationship with, with all of these, well, maybe not all of the teams, but it sounds like you got a pretty good working relationship with, with a lot of these major league teams. Like, how did, how did it get to that point? Uh, did you have any sort of bumpy roads on the way, you know, a few cease and desist letters or anything like that? Or Yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I had a few organizations send me letters back in the day, you know, uh, maybe mid-2000s uh, when we were starting to get a little more popular, but not to the point where we were a reference to a lot of these leagues. Um, but it, it just sort of happened overnight. Uh, the first time I ever got a phone call from a team or a league in a positive sense where they actually wanted me to come cover an event was the AHL's Hershey Bears. Uh, and 
that was just so exciting for me that uh, that a team would even know who I was, <laughs> let alone treat me sort of like royalty. Okay, someone we actually yeah. to cover our event, right? So even though it was sort of like a minor league hockey thing, I got in the car, I drove seven hours down to Hershey, Pennsylvania, and I, I saw their uh, logo and uniform unveiling and drove all the way back home that night. <laughs> uh, that, that's not too, too different than what we do sometimes. Right, and, and, and that was awesome. I loved the experience. And, uh, you know, since then, uh, you know, Major League Baseball reached out to me, and I had a pretty good relationship with them for the last four or five years. Uh, every April this year, uh, aside, I would uh, go down to New York, ha hang out at uh, the MLB uh, oh, network man, so cool. studios, and you know just get to to a sneak peek and a good exclusive interviews with with people behind the scenes for articles that I can put out once um, these things come out. So you know, uh, the fact that they're sort of including me in that and that they trust me enough to see these things early is just it just blows my mind even though it's been happening now for four or five years. Um, you know, since then I, I got to work for the NHL as part of their centennial project. Uh, my job was to research all the logos, make sure their logo timeline was as accurate as possible. Uh, I helped them with a, they had a NHL's all time greatest team tournament on NHL.com where I got to help pick the teams involved, write up all the histories for, um, and so now if you go to NHL.com and you see any of their historical seasons, uh, you'll see they have that season's uh, accurate logos for every team because I went through and I, I got to go to the Hockey Hall of Fame and research everything to make sure that every single logo was as accurate as possible for that year. And yeah, just like an honor, like sort of you know, blows your mind that not only are, are they tolerant of you, but they're asking you for the you know for my help and to sort of be a part of forming the nhl's official logo history now just <laughs> what the heck living the wild. dream wild <laughs> yeah i mean that's that's just amazing that you do something you enjoy from your home you get to travel uh any other uh unveilings unveilings you've been to besides the hershey bears did you go to san diego Oh, yeah, yeah. So Hershey Bears was, was just the first, you know, like that I've, was just the first. I've been to many since. Uh, I, I got to go down to Florida to see the Panthers unveil in 2016. I was in Phoenix for the Diamondbacks when they had the, the uniforms they just recently got rid of. Mm -hmm. uh, I was at the New York Jets unveiling not too long ago. The Padres I was at as well. Uh, man, I can't even think of all the ones I've been to. I went to Milwaukee, so, saw the Bucks when they yeah. did the uniforms. Yeah, so it's something you do on, on a regular basis. Yeah, uh, usually yeah. two times a year. Um, nice. And I, I would do it more often, but I try to pay for the trips myself. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, out of my own pocket. So, yeah. I remember 2001, I was at the baseball winter meetings in December, and I was looking at some logos. And I noticed that the California Angels had a different logo. And I, I said to one of the gentlemen at the booth, oh, that's a new Angels logo. And all of a sudden, this other guy covers it up. We haven't unveiled that yet. You can't see that. <laughs> <laughs> Pretend you never saw that. You ready to have a smartphone back then. <laughs> <laughs> we forget what you saw here. And I thought the guy was going to, like, threaten futility, buddy. But yeah, it wasn't even any cell phones to take a picture of at the time. So <laughs> it's a serious business. They don't want. Yeah, to, no, you're right. Yeah, and you know, I I used to uh, leak stuff when I got a hold of it. Um, the Angels, I think, was one of my first big leaks. Actually, that one you're talking about. Um, but as I got to actually know some of the people who work for the teams and the leagues, and you sort of see uh, how you kind of ruin their work. <laughs> and what goes into making sure this all goes off but a hitch. Uh, I stopped doing it. I, I pulled mm -hmm. back a bit. And I, I think the teams and leagues appreciate that now. I mean, they, they welcome me into their world now, so it must have worked to some extent. But um, I, I don't want to spoil anything for anybody. I'm not here to cause trouble. I'm here to appreciate the logos and uniforms, tell their stories, and, uh, you know, that's not sort of, that's not what I want to do. I don't want to, to ruin things for everybody. I'm not a ruiner. I, I feel like I'm a, I'm a happy guy. <laughs> Make everyone happy as much as possible. 
So were you a, a fan of the teams that had black for black's sake, just teams that had a black jersey just to have a black jersey? Or do you uh, see that trend coming back anytime soon? Well, everything comes back. Yeah. <laughs> it, it'll, well, like, you, you already see people talking about wanting to have the Mets ring back. Yeah, Stroman, definitely. Yeah, um, and it all depends on, again, what was the team wearing when they grew up and started watching baseball? And I don't know the ages of everyone else in this window here. I feel like we're all sort of around the same age. Um, and to me, the black was more of a, a more modern trend. It was, it was unnecessary. It didn't feel right, non-traditional. And like you say, black for black's sake, it was just thrown in there to say we have black, there's no tie to tradition. And um, bringing it back for one game, okay, that's fine. But not as a full-time look. Again, in 10 years, people are gonna get sick of it, they're gonna get rid of it, go back to the classic look and just start the cycle all over again. The infinite throwback cycle. Mm -hmm. you, you just described the, the Toronto Blue Jays through the, the 2000s and the, the Roy Halladay era. And they <laughs> went to the black and I don't know yeah. if anybody was all over the black. I think nobody liked the black, except for maybe J.P. Ricciardi. And, uh, and then, yeah, full circle, black's gone. You, and you everybody rejoices when they bring back the old blue with the... You, with you, the needed, you needed to go in a completely opposite direction, again, for us to really appreciate and love and demand the return of that original look, right? Like... If, if they just wore it all the way through, imagine they wore that original uniform, you know, up until 2011 or something. By now, people would be tired of it. they say, oh, that look is stale. We need a new look. And they, they try something else. But the fact that it went away for a while, it made us miss it. It sort of made us love it a little bit more. Absence makes the heart grow fonder, they say. And but, that's a perfect example of that. But yeah, Brewers, Milwaukee's really, perfect example. Does it really have to work like that? Or, you know... You, you don't hear that coming out of New York or, or Boston. You know, you don't hear, you don't hear, uh, Green Bay, you know, Red Sox fans clamoring for a different oh, yeah, they're, because they're tired of it. Oh, um, yeah, they do around here. Oh, and the Red Sox have changed their uniforms quite a bit. But yeah, not your, your point is a good one. But there, there comes a point where you've either had a logo or uniform for a certain amount of time or you've won a certain amount of champions, championships with it where people will turn it into something iconic on its own. It, it needs to survive the point where people are getting tired of it and making, you know, it, oh, this feels old, it feels stale, we need a change. If you survive that period and you're winning, most importantly, it becomes an iconic logo on its own. Yeah, that's interesting. Like the, uh, with the Blue Jays and, and, you know, they won with the, the sort of classic look that they have they abandoned and have since come back to. Um, but I, for me, a team like the Denver Broncos, which had a, a sort of a different look, a lighter blue with the D and the horse coming out, um, I, I don't see them ever going back to that after they won those two championships with the sort of Navy helmet and, and the, and the, uh, and the uh, you know, more fierce sort of stallion head. Um, they won those two with Elway, and, and then I felt that they were locked in, and then really the only change that they actually made when they won with the Peyton Manning was they went back to the orange jerseys, which I think people were demanding, not necessarily the jerseys they had, you know, previously, but, but having like that orange um, as a dominant color. And, and I can't see, uh, I can't see the Broncos going back to the old, to the old D. No, I mean, they can bring it back as a throwback, which they've done in a few, a few years, right? They were with the color rush uniforms. Oh, that's swearing. Don't say that. Color rush. <laughs> it's a fact. <laughs> <laughs> they accept, accept it, whether you like it or not. Uh -huh. uh, but that, that's, that's a compromise, right? So here's a throwback logo. We'll wear it once or twice a year. We're keeping the current color scheme. This color scheme won three Super Bowls. That old D logo, what, how many Super Bowls did they lose while they were wearing that? Two uh, or three. Yeah. And well, so uh, I, about four. Yeah, yeah. Four Every single one while they, they yeah. were wearing orange jerseys for a lot of those ones. Too. Cowboys, Giants. Well, you've got Niners. the same thing going on in New England. Um, <laughs> most of the people prefer Pat the Patriot, but they were generally a laughing stock when they wore that uniform, the far superior uniform in my opinion. But when they switched to Flying Elvis, 
they've won six Super Bowls, so <laughs> we're stuck with them. And exact same thing in Tampa Bay, right? Everyone wants Bucko Bruce, but Bucko Bruce started what? Oh, and twenty six. Oh, and twenty six. Yeah, he sure did. Is that the, the crazy Pirate call? Flag, Pirate flag won a Super Bowl. So I didn't know his name was Bucko Bruce. I always thought he was just a yeah. gay pirate. <laughs> no, Bucko Bruce. <laughs> I don't know if that is the Bucko Bruce the official name. That's just a name that we started calling him that. I should look into that. More I read somewhere he had a name, but it had knows. to come from somewhere. It hadn't come from you or, or Paul Lucas. I don't know. I don't think it came from me. <laughs> Maybe it came from Paul. <laughs> so, so, Chris, if there, I'm sorry. Oh, Chris, if there was a team right now that that said, "Hey, redesign our uniforms or give us some ideas," but of the big four, which one would that be? Why are you putting me on the spot like that? <laughs> <laughs> or or any team, any league, I don't know. Well, I feel like, like I would love to see the Tampa Bay Rays try something differently. Okay. Like, for a team with I, – I know they switched to a Sun Ray as their sort of official, uh, you know, or, uh, inspiration of their uniform. But they keep the Double Ray logo on the sleeve. They have the, the Stingrays out in center field. For a team with sort of like a cool animal like that, Fish – they they really sort of play it cool you know they don't they, they don't do anything fun or exciting they don't really embrace the they have yellow in there like why not you know bring the yellow out a little bit more mm -hmm. they have a cool history with the gradients and stuff like and yet their home road and alternate uniforms is just rays Plank. yeah and straight mm -hmm. serif font <laughs> with a blue and white oh. yeah yeah, even their T and B are not interlocking, which bothers me. Does right. it bother you? I, I never really thought about it. <laughs> okay, good. It, it bothers, bothers me. me. Uh, I just look at that jersey and, and Rays. They just put, let's put a period at the end of it. Just See, that Chris, I thought you were going to say that they should just adapt something that's like over your right shoulder there and they'd be good to go. Well, like what? The, but, well, like that nice little blue cap back there with the with the red, white, and blue logo on it. Oh, I see what you're saying. Like, <laughs> the caps moved to Montreal. They moved to Montreal. <laughs> I would love to see Montreal get a team back. I'd hate for it to be at the expense of another fan base. Um, I I think it would be neat if they tried that split season idea, just because I kind of enjoy chaos. <laughs> <laughs> it's good for business. Well, you're going to love this season, then. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> uh, but, you know, just to sort of see how that works. Are they going to be called Tampa Bay hyphen Montreal? Are they going to have some sort of unified name? Uh, that, to me, is is all very exciting. And, and seeing how they handle that and the branding and the, and the logo and the uniform. Do they wear a different uniform, different halves of the season? Do they change their names halfway through? And, you know, just to have baseball back in Montreal. <laughs> like that would be that would be fantastic in a new stadium of course in a new stadium yeah, absolutely. definitely <laughs> definitely a new stadium because that thing is uh talk about a white elephant yeah um, that's just hanging out there it's not even good for cfl football is it even being used for anything now uh yeah the alouettes will play uh, their playoff games up there mm -hmm. and i think even the montreal impact might play some of their playoff games up there now and then just anything they need a, a big audience for and plus the jays play two games there every year yeah, I yeah, did a to, tour. I did a tour um, up there of the Olympic Stadium, and uh, probably probably the most depressing tour ever. Because um, <laughs> this was after the Expos had left and everything, and and I actually asked the tour guide off to the side, I'm like, "How many dates do you book here?" And, and the answer was like five. Yeah. They booked like wow. five days a year. Wow! Now that was like before. That was before um, the impact were around, and that was also before the Jays started coming back for exhibitions. So now they're up to ten. 10. Yeah, <laughs> it, but yeah, it was you know like they'd get like a, an, an Alouettes playoff game or two, and um, uh, if they get the Great Cup, it'll go there. They had the icon, and, and, and there'll be like a, a tractor pull or, or you know motocross so or one of those deals. When, whenever anyone sort of rags on uh, Expo's attendance, I, I just say, look, you never went to a game there. Uh, it felt like they were trying to keep you from going to the game. Uh, <laughs> so I, I went through a bunch of Expo's games in the, the late 90s and into the 2000s, and they would have one gate open. 
and every single fan trying to go to that stadium had to go through one gate and it would just take forever. Like there'd be 3000 fans at the game, but it would take you 45 minutes to get in. And this is like pre nine 11 security screening, right? Like, so you're all sort of herded into this, this indoor plaza and just, you can't move and you're waiting and waiting and waiting, can't go anywhere. And you know, the stadium's going to be half empty. So that was like, as soon as you get there, you're already miserable. <laughs> you get in the stadium, it's dark, it's dreary. The seats. Uh, the, the seats are terrible, right? Oh, those oh little goodness. buckets? Yeah. And yeah, like, like spacey yeah. seats. And, and you, you stand up and it like grabs your jersey and <laughs> stuck into the seat. And uh, I remember sitting all by myself and there was a bucket in, on, in the row next to me just collecting all the water that was dripping from the roof. That was <laughs> so the whole game I hear <clears throat> two, two, <laughs> for two and a half hours. And uh, I tried to get up to move to another section. And... <laughs> Uh, the security guards who are, are dressed like police officers, right? They have like the, the, the light blue shirt and like the belt and everything. And they go, no, get back. Like, why? <laughs> You're not allowed to leave. <laughs> oh, so, I hate when they do that. And, and it was just, you know, I, every time I go, I went to a game at Olympic Stadium, I left going, I'm never coming to another game here again. And then, and then I would come back, right? But <laughs> even when the Jays came back, and played in Montreal. I went to the first game up there. I think they were playing the Mets. And I took out my camera to take a picture of uh, Bartolo Colon. Like, oh, here's an expo in the outfield, playing, you know. And the security guard walks over, put your camera away. What? <laughs> <laughs> I have cameras like that. You know, like, <laughs> and, and, and I just looked at him, I said, man, it's, now, I remember why, now I remember why you don't have a team anymore. <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness. But, I, always, I always felt that the air in there just, didn't feel right there was something and I you know I've been to I've been to the Trop and, and I've been to Rogers Center a million times but in Olympic Stadium the air just did not feel right it, it, I don't yeah, know it, I don't know what it was like a, sort of like a musty feel like you felt like you were getting sick just by breathing yeah yeah exactly <laughs> and, and it wasn't like smoke it no, was just bleh. It, it was just old air that had been trapped there since they sealed the roof on there yeah. <laughs> now I've been to Tropicana Field as well, and I hear a lot of people, you know, hating on that. And Tropicana Field versus Olympic Stadium, night and day. Tropicana oh. Field oh, is not even close. Palace. I walked in there <laughs> expecting the worst, and I thought this place is amazing. Why is everyone complaining about it? Oh, but like, you can, you, there's sunlight. You can see light. There's you know good views everywhere. Yeah. Go to Olympic. Especially Stadium. when it's like and, ninety and it's, degrees out. And you walk in and you get this nice blast of air conditioning. You're like, it's perfect. Oh, that's oh, nice. Wait till you go to Arizona, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> yes, See, if, I go to, if I go to Arizona in the next eight years, then I'll <laughs> let you know. <laughs> well, we, yeah, yeah, when I was there, it was 120 down to 60. And, and you just heard everybody go, ah. Oh. But the, when I went to the when I went to Tampa, the, the, uh, the ticket taker, and the security guys in the front, they were awesome. They're like, Come on in, right this way. Air conditioning this way. Come on in. <laughs> like, there. Who cares who's playing? There's air conditioning in here. <laughs> know your audience. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Olympic Stadium was definitely uh, a very dreary place, but so was the Metrodome in uh, Minneapolis. Uh, another place where you, it was a snooze fest. It was, you know, maybe during the 1991 World Series, it was the place to be. But I was there in 1995 and. The crowd was just out of it, and nobody told me I couldn't take any pictures, but I, I, I fell asleep. It, I was so bored. I mean, I was like, oh. yeah. So those two stadiums, you know, I was – when people ask me, Montreal probably number one, but Minnesota's a kind of a close second as well. And those were the, uh, the two teams up for contraction, right? That's, yeah, how about ooh, that? Right. How about that? Now they have a beautiful ballpark. I love Target Field. I think it's – Montreal well, had their beautiful ballpark too. They could have got the, oh, the land wow. the funding. Yeah, you're right because that was a website they had to uh, uh, to Le fund the. Uh, I remember Bat reading Park. about that Labatt Park. I was like, oh, cool, they're going to get a stadium, and then it was this but, beautiful outdoor stadium, and and I just remember seeing the scoreboard. They had that Expo script on the scoreboard. Yeah. And I thought, wow, it looks so weird seeing the Expos in a real baseball stadium. Yeah, it felt unreal, and it was unreal. It never happened. Wow. Even in this world. 
Yeah, well, Tampa Bay too. They they want to build a new stadium. I've seen about three different designs. In Oakland, I've seen a couple Same designs. Thing, yeah. And like, when is this going to happen? You know, another ten years. All right, so Chris, let's jump back to your website for a minute. I know a big part of what you try to do is be as comprehensive as possible. Mm -hmm. And I want to jump back to a topic we actually dedicated a whole podcast to once, was the rebranding in the minor leagues, specifically like all the food nights and the, uh, the Spanish nights. H how do you uh, keep up with everything on your website? I have a wonderful writer on my site named Paul Caputo, and he – his only job on the website is to take care of the minor league promotional Ooh. days because I absolutely cannot keep up with it myself <laughs> on top of everything else. Right. And, uh, you know, kudos to Paul. He's on it. He's got it. Uh, there's just so, I mean, in fact, there's so many that we sometimes have to skip over some of them just because we simply can't cover them all. Uh, so uh, they started doing that, the, uh, Oh, what is it called? The, the Copa, where yes. they all have sort of an alternate uh, Hispanic identity. And fortunately, they all unveil those on the exact same day now. <laughs> so we can just cover it all in one post. You're working overtime that day, Paul. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He knows. 140 different articles in one day. Nice. <laughs> no, I, I give Paul the heads up. I was like, look, they've told me it's going to be next week. Clear your schedule if you can. <laughs> You're going to be busy all day. But he loves it. He likes it. That's his thing. Um, all right. So uh, let's. I've, I uh, wanted to f uh, finish up our our hour today with a, a lightning round. But actually, we've kind of talked touched on a bunch of the things I had. So uh, let me ask you, Chris. Do you have a favorite logo? Hartford Whalers. Wow. What everybody says. My kid is six years old now, but last year I took to a, an Ottawa Senators game and on the drive up to Ottawa. Uh, the reason why we did that is because it's 30 bucks to go to an Ottawa Senators game and $400 to go to a Leafs game. So it's cheaper hotel plus gas plus tickets to go to I Ottawa. know that story. You know, yeah, <laughs> sounds familiar. And, and he was just obsessed with, with old hockey teams on the drive up, five years old. And where did the Hurricanes come from? Well, let me introduce you to the Hartford Whalers. <laughs> and by the time we got to the hotel, he was obsessed with Brass Bonanza. He was singing it. He was annoying his sister and his mom. <laughs> and going like, we go up to the Parliament buildings in Ottawa. He's singing Brass Bonanza. <laughs> and we, we get to the arena. It's Ottawa versus St. Louis, which... Uh, I mean, St. Louis goes on to win the Stanley Cup, but at the time they were like last place in the NHL. So like no one cares about the game. And there's the organist is in the section next to us. And we decide to go up and say hi to him during a break. And my son just goes up and says, play Grass Bonanza, play Grass Bonanza. <laughs> and you guys, how the heck do you know what that is? And we go back to our seats and there's Brass Bonanza playing for everyone once again. Awesome. At the NHL Arena. And they all loved it, right? The whole nice. not a single person cared. Oh, what's the matter with that? <laughs> not, not a lot. Not at that time. I was so excited. I was like, "Yes, oh, that's, a, that's, the that's awesome." That must have been a really tough drive for you, as you're you're driving along and he's asking about all these old hockey teams and old oh, hockey. Man. Just wait a second. Let me oh. pull over and get a Kleenex. I was going to say boy. team drive. I've been waiting my whole life for that moment. Oh, <laughs> now, now, did you you could blow his mind when uh, Hartford had their farm team in Binghamton? I'm sure you're well aware of this. They rotated the logo 90 degrees, and aha, now it's a B. That's that's one of the greatest things I've ever seen. Right? Not only yeah. do you take the the clever Hartford Whalers logo, but you repurpose it to make it even more clever for the minor league team. That's so when people say. Uh, oh, I hate when a minor league team just uses their major league identity. I say, no, I, I like it when they do that, but get creative with it and try to mm -hmm. turn it into their mm -hmm. own thing while also sort of acknowledging the link. And the, yeah. the Whalers are a great example of that. Yeah, like when the Mets uh, would have their farm teams, they would have the Skyline logo based on uh, the region, like uh, Pittsfield Mets would have mountains instead of right. the skyscraper. And I love really, that. Too. I never knew that. And yeah. It, it, and, makes the people of Pittsfield feel like they're part of the Mets organization, yeah. right? That they're, we're all in this together and we're all Mets and 
were special enough that you actually made your own logo for us that incorporated yeah. our skyline. Yeah, or even the Bingham Tin Mets, they had a B. They had a really cool looking B. I thought it was a heck of a lot better than the Rumble Ponies, but I get it. I can see that name changing in a few years, or I can see that team changing in a few years, <laughs> maybe sooner. Yeah, it's going to look different. And uh, oh. when we come out of this, it's going to look so different. Uh, Chris, is there a fantastic logo that you're really fond of that we've never heard of? Like okay. Something really obscure that you just love? Well, going back to Binghamton, the, before the Whalers, they were the Broom Dusters in the A. Yes. Yeah. Do you know that logo? Yeah, the, yeah, uh, the guy who did B BC, uh, the comic Tom. BC. So the fact that you've heard of it means I need to come up with another one. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, th this is a pretty obscure hockey right. group right here, so it's tough to put a hockey logo past us. We'll flash up the logo when we do the uh, video. Or, uh, whatever. <laughs> so if I was out in my man cave, I could just pull the puck and say, here it is. Uh -huh, you well, have a, I don't know what you guys I have a puck, doing. yes. I have a uh, Broom County Dusters puck, yes. That's amazing. Yeah, Broom County, that's right. On my other screen here, I have this amazing website, and all I had to do was just go boom, boom, and I found this. I found the exact logo that he was talking about. It's amazing. What website is that? I would love to visit it. <laughs> it's called sportslogos.net. It's amazing. <laughs> if you haven't checked it out, what are you waiting for? Come on, it's been there 23 years. It's old enough yeah. to drink. <laughs> so, so you like the Dusters logo. Why do you like that obscure Duster logo? Just because? Why well, I like it, well, you, first of all, you said it had to be obscure, so that yeah. sort of limited my my choice. Okay, but it, it's interesting, right? It's, it's done by that cartoonist. Yeah, yeah. No, you're right. I can't and, think of his and, name right now. And yeah, I can't remember his name. That's why I'm I'm trying to Johnny describe. Johnny John Hart. Hart Hart right? John yeah. Hart. Hey, look at that. Um, yeah, it's 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 just a fun minor league logo, and and it's stood the test of time. Like we still remember, we're talking about it longer than the team ever played. Uh, another one, uh, Charleston Charlies. Do you know that one? Oh, the cigar with the yeah. top right. hat. Yeah, they all with the old like nineteen uh, thirties hat and the cigar. That's yeah, it's because the I guess the the owner used to wear I guess bowler hats and sh and chew cigars, so he came up with a logo that looked like him, you, or you somebody wanna, did. You, do you, you want to write for logos? I mean, <laughs> yeah, I'll I'll write. <laughs> I see. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah, there's a, a nice little video. Uh, here in Indiana, in, there's a, a team called the Logansport Berries, and their logo is Felix the Cat. Nice. That's awesome. And they actually have the creator, the guy who writes it now, not the creator. He's been passed away for many years. It, it's the oldest high school logo in, in the state, and he comes in from time to time to make appearances, and he grants them the, the rights to use uh, Felix the Cat. And, and – the team's called the Berries, which is based on a 1920s slang term. And I, I love the logo. It's just Felix the Cat. He's just such a, a cool-looking cartoon. Has nothing to do with the Berries, but and that Felix, would be my favorite obscure logo. Felix the Cat has almost vanished completely from popular. <laughs> You're right. Now, what I heard, and, and I don't know if you know anything about this, 1927 Yankees, they used Felix the Cat as a, a good luck charm. I've I don't know if you can do some that. research on that or. I will now. <laughs> I've, <laughs> I've read about that on <laughs> Wikipedia, and I read that in the 20s. Felix was used as good luck for certain sports teams. Well, but that's all I know. That's all I know. Wikipedia is definitely true. Yeah, well, hey, I've read on the, a few. There's the broom pages, dusters, too. guys. Yeah, there you go. I see nothing, but I believe you. Hester, yeah. <laughs> okay, it's gone. <laughs> All right, my, my favorite old logo would be the old, from the IHL days, the Milwaukee Admirals, hmm. the drunk Captain Crunch logo. Yeah. That's one that I just, I still love to this day. Eh, I never it it looks that. like you just had a, you know, a, a really good shore leave or something. And, and then he died, right? And now his, their logo yeah, is yeah that, that whole story with the, uh, the kid skeleton that yeah. they came up with was just, I don't know, didn't work for me anyway. It's fun. It, it, <laughs> it, it, it tells the story, right? Like, that's all I care about, really. It tells a story. Yeah. Well, aren't they named after a brand of uh, refrigerators, the Admirals? Yeah, yeah, probably. Was it a washing yeah. machine or a refrigerator? One or the other. Sort of home they, brought, they brought back the logo last year with... Right. Yes, it was, I thought it was a refrigerator. And this, I think it was, ref, it was a personification. I, I, I'm going to agree with you, Mark. Yeah. Something else that Paul Caputo covered for me. <laughs>
and uh, yeah, so that very popular in, in minor league sports in the day, right? Just naming yourself after whatever the local industry was. At Green Bay Packers, right? That's amazing. Perfect example. And the Oshawa General, my, my old hometown team, uh, named after General Motors GM, which was headquartered in Oshawa. So yeah, it, it's also a good way to, to tell the history of your town, right? Even after GM has now left Oshawa, uh, the team will forever be known as the Oshawa Generals and still sort of tell that story so people can remember. Uh, it, wasn't it strange when they, uh, they changed the name of the arena to the Tribute Community Center as opposed to the, the GM Center? It, would, it, it just never made any sense. Yeah, it's like I'm, I'm okay with naming rights for arenas where the name actually kind of makes sense. Uh, and the GM center in Oshawa for the Oshawa generals was a perfect example. Like that's, it's almost like what you would have named the arena anyways. <laughs> yeah. Right? Um, and now to get rid of it, name it after a company that creates housing, you know, new houses for sale in yeah. Oshawa is just, it, it's, it's meaningless. It's nothing. And you see that all across North America with these arenas and stadiums named after nothing, right? Like it doesn't sound like an arena or a stadium. Guaranteed rate field. My my very first ever NHL regular season game, because uh, Toronto was always sold out, was during a family vacation to Florida at the historic National Car Rental Center. <laughs> like... Which went through 50 names as well in yeah. such a short period of time. Is it, even, is it the BT&T Center now or... It's a bank of some sort. Yeah, SunTrust. I don't know what it's called, but and I think that's yeah. Oh, that bothers me too. Coors Field, perfect name, Miller Park. Exactly. Excellent name, yeah. but that's changing from what I hear, right, Miller? Yeah, Miller's changing. I don't know if oh. they announced the new name yet, but it's supposed to change. Really? Wow, that's that's hard to think of. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So um, before we wrap up, Chris, the opposite is there a logo being being the uh, the you know the harbinger of all knowledge logo wise is there one that just doesn't do it for you Probably. i'll let you think. i'll give my example while you're thinking <laughs> yeah thank god the vancouver <laughs> the vancouver canucks when they rebranded to the, the whale yeah that's a because good i read a story maybe i read it on sports logo <laughs> about how they were doing it with the uh the whale jumping out of the ocean and stuff so in my head i had envisioned you know, the seat for the Canucks with a nice curling whale and a anatomically correct uh, killer whale jumping out of it. And then you looked at it, it looked like a five-year-old drew it. It really disappointed me. And I've never gotten over that disappointment. You, well, you didn't read about it on sportslogos.net. That was 1998. <laughs> the site was up then, but I, we weren't doing any news back then. Sure. Um, yeah, I, I'd agree. The Canucks are a little disappointing. The entire Canucks branding history has been disappointing to be yeah, honest. some teams just mm -hmm. can't find they, they got the colors right they got they got the colors right now for a team like the canucks with that name uh that sort of alternate they call officially they call it the tertiary logo where it's the johnny canuck johnny canuck yeah that's what a canuck is right like it's sort of your stereotypical canadian especially that part of the world you know a, a log rider and stuff and uh, I feel like that would be a pretty strong element to go with, um, but they bury it, right? Like it's not even worn on the uniforms any anywhere. They don't promote it anywhere. Maybe if you're lucky, you'll see it on a goalie mask, right? But um, yeah, if, if I was the Canucks, I would go that direction, uh, you know, and stick with a one color scheme, please. <laughs> Pick one and, and go with it and find your identity, find who you are and just stay with it. Like they keep throwing back, oh, we might go back to the skate. We might go back to the black and yellow. We might, might go back to the stick and the rink. And you can't do that. You know, you're going to end up like the Brewers where you have five different identities and everyone loves each one. As long as they don't go back to the V. Oh, the brown and v? orange V sweater. <laughs> the V for oh. victory. I, w I was reading an article uh, yesterday uh, from 1980 where a sex columnist. Now tell me if this is too risque for your show. I don't know. <laughs> the answer people. already is no. <laughs> there is a sex columnist in a Vancouver newspaper saying that the V uniform 
is suggestive. Su suggestive. Oh my goodness. It points. Look where it points is what you <laughs> and, <that's> what <laughs> and I'm just reading that going, uh, I don't think so. <laughs> oh, man. Thanks for trying. Well, on that note. <laughs> <laughs> what better way to leave? I don't feel so bad about my question before the show, man. <laughs> okay. You got anything else, Mark? No, that's it. I think that's a good way to end it. I, uh... Hey, guys, I have a book coming out. Can I talk oh, about sweet. What, Chris, well, I want to give you the opportunity to plug everything and anything you want to plug out sure. before I'll, you I'll leave. Plug. I have a book coming out with Todd Radom, who is a graphic designer, uh, well-known within the industry. I know him. Uh, so he and I were doing a book called Fabric of the Game. <clears throat> it's available for okay. pre-order now. And it, it's a deep dive into the visual history of every single NHL franchise that ever existed. We go through team by team. We even do like the Philadelphia Quakers up to the Vegas Golden Knights. Oh. And, uh, we try to get, you know, where available quotes from the uh, actual designers, everyone involved, find out any sort of alternate ideas they were thinking of, what, why they chose the colors they did. And uh, it's sort of like, yeah, try to figure out the origin stories behind every team. And that is scheduled to come out, I believe, October 6th right now. So hmm. I recommend it. Big nice, book. I must have it. Where, where can you find, where can where you can find, we find that it? book? It is available wherever books are sold, as they say. Okay. <laughs> but it's, it's, on, uh, it's on Amazon right now. Any other site that sells books, it should be there. Mm -hmm. So and I do have one more question. Do you know what the name of the new uh, Seattle NHL team will be? <laughs> Are you trying to have the scoop on the Stadium Journey podcast? <laughs> <laughs> yes, because it better not be cracking. <laughs> uh, I, I have heard things. I cannot okay. confirm nor deny. Uh, okay. I had a feeling it was going to be one of those answers. That's okay. I don't know. How about, how about all those killer Hornets mock-ups that have been hitting the internet lately? No. <laughs> <laughs> that's going to be a minor league team right that's going to be oh uh, it's got to be yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Happen. In, until they start killing people yes that's going to be a team oh avalanche <laughs> kills people okay yeah. well <laughs> well once the swarm comes because you know that's coming next because that's just the way the world's going these days <laughs> <laughs> well, i have a friend who's a beekeeper he says that the murder hornets are being sensationalized Oh, that's right, murder hornets. I call them killer hornets. Murder hornets, <laughs> killer bees. I hope your your beekeeping friend is right. It sounds like he's an expert in the field, so I will. He is. It, it's it's for him. It was a hobby, and he quit his job, and now it's a full time gig, and he makes honey, and it's probably the best honey you can buy as well. Sounds sounds familiar. Yeah, <laughs> sounds familiar. And speaking of familiar, you can uh, check out all Chris's work at sportslogos.net. And if our listeners want to follow you. On the Twitter machine or anything like that, Chris, where can they find you? At Sports Logos Net. All right. It's great to have the brand all consistent, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks again for coming, Chris. I, I could uh, sit here and talk for hours about this, but we, we don't want to keep you all night. So yeah, what time Thanks, again. Thanks again for joining us. <laughs> yeah, no problem. It was fun, guys. Thanks a lot. All right. Thank and you. Thanks to everybody who's been listening and following along on our live stream. Uh, Dan is not with us right now. He is in the studio uh, silently watching. You can follow him on Twitter at DanLaw83. Mark, how about you? Where can our listeners follow you online? Uh, you can follow me on Instagram or Twitter, Ballpark Hunter, and on YouTube at Ballpark Hunter. Subscribe. I talk about ballpark visits every week. How about you, Dave? Where can our listeners follow you online? Uh, Twitter and Instagram at ProFan9. And you can follow my stadium journeys on Twitter or Instagram at PuckmanRI. And don't forget our website, stadiumjourney.com. Follow Stadium Journey on Twitter or Instagram. Where else? At Stadium Journey. And you can find the Stadium Journey podcast at thebradyhicks.com or search VOC Nation wherever you search for your podcasts. And remember, we're now simulcasting live at twitch.tv slash demo83, Facebook Live. Instagram Live, YouTube, we're all over the place. And uh, we're going to start now going back to our regular every other week schedule. Obey the Puck will occupy this time slot on the alternate Tuesdays. You can join Kelly Levy, Dan, and myself next week, believe it or not. 
there is hockey news to discuss. And the Stadium Journey podcast will return right here in two weeks on May 26, when we'll be joined by the owner of the Toronto Rock of the National Lacrosse League, Jamie Dawick. Did nice. I say that right? Did I say that right, Dave? Yeah, I think so. Dawick, Dawick, and Dawick. I apologize, Jamie, for messing up your name. So for Dave Calachico, Mark Viquez, and Dave Cotney, I'm Paul Baker. Until next time, everyone, please take care of yourselves and take care of each other.